The words to which I should like to call your attention this evening are to be found in the book of the Acts of the Apostles, in chapter 4, reading again verses 23 and 24. And the account goes on to give us the remainder of their prayer, and how God answered their prayer by, you remember, shaking the building in which they were assembled, and filling them all again with the Holy Spirit. Now, this, uh, as those who attend here regularly will realize, is a sequel to what uh, we've been considering in the previous two paragraphs. And let me remind you very hurriedly of what that is, otherwise, of course, we shan't be able to understand the meaning and the point and the purpose of this message that is contained in what we are considering together tonight. We read that being let go, they went to their own company. That's a reference, of course, to Peter and John, two of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. They had just been arraigned before the court, the great Jewish court, the Sanhedrin. They'd been put on trial. They'd been put on trial not only because of the miracle that they'd performed in the healing of a man who'd been born lame, a man over 40 years of age, whom they'd suddenly healed in the name of Christ, they were on trial not only because they'd done that, but still more, perhaps, because of their preaching. The crowd had gathered together out of curiosity and excitement to see the men who'd been healed and to see these two remarkable men that had succeeded in healing him. And Peter had preached to them on two occasions, and he had not only explained to them how he and John had been given such power, but he had shown them the relevance of all that to themselves. That they mustn't just look on as spectators at some phenomenon, that this was a message to them of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ and what it all meant to them. Well, now, they'd been put on trial because of this. And as we've been seeing in the uh, uh, trial chamber, in the courtroom, they'd uh, asserted themselves, they'd spoken their message, they'd spoken with real boldness, though they were really just ordinary men, fishermen, unlearned and ignorant men, they'd not been overawed nor frightened by the great Sanhedrin. They'd persisted in speaking the truth. But the court had decided to tell them that they must stop doing this and that if they went on doing it, well, then they would have to bear the consequences. Peter had answered, saying, whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God judge ye. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. And here the great court is in trouble. So we read that when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding nothing how they might punish them because of the people. For all men glorified God for that which was done. For the man was above forty years old on whom this miracle of healing was shown. Now then, here are Peter and John sent out with this Tremendous warning, this great threat, that if they persisted in this preaching in the name of Jesus, well then, they'd not only be arrested again, uh, undoubtedly they would be put to death. And here we are now looking at Peter and John. What do they do? Well, they go back to their own company, go back to the other apostles and to those people who, having been converted on the day of Pentecost and afterwards, were now forming the Christian church. They go back to their own company and they report to them what happened. And then we are told the result of that. Now, why are we dealing with this? Well, it's still the same object which we've had in mind now for many, many months in studying this book of the Acts of the Apostles. We are interested in this, not only because of its own inherent importance and worth, not merely because it does happen to be history. We are interested in it because it is a vital concern to us. This, after all, is the authentic account of what the Christian church is. What is the Christian church? That's the great question today. Well, here's the only answer, the only authentic answer. Other people can put up their thoughts and ideas, but that's only their own speculation. This is how the thing began. And therefore, in honesty, we are bound to go back to this and to consider what it's got to say. And uh, we have another object, and it's this. What is Christianity? What is its message? What has it got to say to us? What is 
its relevance to the, our modern position in this world as it is tonight. Now these are the questions that we are considering together. And we've had many answers to that question. You can't read about these apostles without seeing what to be a Christian really means. They made it so plain, not only in their behavior, but also in their speech and in their teaching. And we've been looking at all this, and as we've done so, we've been examining ourselves. We've been testing ourselves. You know, the mere fact that we may think we are Christians doesn't prove we are Christians. There are curious ideas and notions as to what constitutes a Christian. So we must all examine ourselves and test ourselves in the light of this. And all we are told about these men has been providing us, therefore, with a very thorough and a very profound test. Now, here tonight, we've got still another test, which we must of necessity apply to ourselves. Now, let me put it before you like this. How does one know that one is truly Christian? What would you say is the kind of acid test to apply to anybody who makes a profession of being a Christian? There are many answers that are given to that. Some people seem to think that it's merely a matter of tradition and of upbringing. But if you happen to have been brought up in what's called a Christian country and have been taught to go to church or chapel, and to Sunday school and so on, well, that that automatically makes you a Christian. Purely a matter of tradition and of upbringing. Perhaps you were christened as a child, and many believe that that does it, that made you a Christian. And there are many who just take it at that and assume that that is what it tells. Is that what Christianity means? You can be such a Christian without knowing anything of your Bible, without being able to give any reason as to why you're a Christian. You've not even taken the trouble to study it, but you've just assumed that there it is, a matter of custom, practice, and habit, without ever really understanding what it's all about. Well, I needn't insult you. I needn't waste your time by dealing with that. I'm not here to say that there is no value in tradition. There is. Thank God for every good tradition. But if you live on tradition... You're in a parlous and in a pathetic condition. It isn't that. Then there are others who seem to think that what uh, it really constitutes is that one holds a given set of beliefs. And of course this is important. You can't be a Christian without believing something. If a man doesn't believe anything, well, whatever else he is, he is not a Christian. It does constitute a body of belief. And there are some who think that that's all that it is. They've been taught these uh, teachings. They were taught them probably as children. They accepted them, never really examined them. They just took them, and they've always taken them in the same way. What of such people? Well, I want to try to show you that while orthodoxy is essential uh, to our being Christian, it doesn't make us Christian. It is possible for a man to receive teaching with his mind without its going any further. It is possible for a man to be a kind of dry-as-dust theologian, but it's of no value to him. There are men and women, there have been men and women, who've known the truth and believed it in their minds, but when they came to die, they felt bereft and lost, and they've got nothing to fall back upon. That's not Christianity. You have to believe the truth, but a mere intellectual acceptance of the truth does not make us Christians. Then, as you know, there are others who think that we're makes a man a Christian is that he lives a good life, that he's moral. In a world where there's so much immorality, he is moral. He doesn't do certain things. Many people have thought that that's Christianity. If a man doesn't drink and commit adultery or gamble or smoke and a few other things, they say, well, he's a Christian. Purely negative. He just doesn't do certain things. That makes him a Christian. I, again, don't insult your intelligence by dealing with that. Others say, no, no, it's a, it's a bit more positive than that. He must be out to do good. He must be out to help his fellow men and women. He must have a bit of a concern about life and the state of humanity at the present time. That, to them, is what makes a man a Christian. Ideals, out to do good. And then there are still others who would say that what makes a man a Christian is none of those things. No, no, they say you're quite right. A man can subscribe intellectually only to a given number of beliefs. 
A man can be brought up to do this sort of thing and do it mechanically and be even regular in doing so and never miss a service, but it doesn't make him a Christian, of course, you're quite right. Neither uh, is a mere orthodoxy sufficient, neither is philanthropy or morality sufficient. Well, we say to this man, what do you say makes a Christian? Ah, says this man, it's experience. I want to know of any man who claims to be a Christian, has he had some dramatic experience, some kind of climactic experience? Has he had a vision? Has he seen a ball of fire, as it were? Has he had some extraordinary experience? Or they may put it in these terms, is he, has his life been changed? Has something happened to him that has just turned him round and made a different man of him? That's to me, says this person, the essence of Christianity. Well, now, I again am very ready to agree that you can't really be a Christian without some experience. It isn't mere intellectualism. It isn't mere goodness. It is a living and a vital experience. But you know, my friends, there are many experiences that people have and uh, have had and which have done them great good. But those experiences don't make them Christian. I've known many people who've had experiences, you know, your psychotherapist can sometimes do it, and your psychologist. And there are other cults and teachings that can give people experiences, but that doesn't make us Christian. Now, what then is your test? How do you know whether you're a Christian or not, says somebody? And it's a vital question, because it's the only hope in the world tonight. What is the kind of acid test that you apply? Well, I, I'm going to put it to you tonight that the only real thoroughgoing test is the test we've got in this incident that we are looking at together at this moment. It is this. How does one react to trying and testing circumstances? That's the test. As I say, you may have been religious all your life, and as long as life is going fairly smoothly and evenly, all is well. Suddenly you find yourself in a great crisis. And you become aware for the first time that all your religion means nothing at all to you. Doesn't help you. Is of no value to you. You see, the way to test a profession is the test of circumstances, trials, tribulations, troubles, death perhaps, staring you in the face. That's the test. Now, you see, this is the test which goes more thoroughly than all the other tests. I say again, many a man has been very orthodox, but he's found that his orthodoxy didn't help him when he was face to face with his hour of need. And you know, when you're in some grievous trouble, your own goodness and morality doesn't help you. It doesn't sustain you. The fact that you've done a lot of good to others doesn't somehow answer your problems. Here you are with a crushing problem. What have you got? And it's the same with some of these experiences that people talk about. They really don't help them, just when they need the help most of all. Now, I'm saying all this, I've really been giving you a summary of the whole of the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, there's a great dispute going on between the true prophets and the false prophets. Now, the false prophets could always put up a very good show. Indeed, it was such a good show that they were almost invariably much more popular than the true prophets. They seemed to give us satisfaction, and it was so much easier and simpler, and people believed them, the crowd generally followed them, but you know, when the testing time came, they'd got nothing. It's all summarized in one great incident, Elijah on Mount Carmel. Your false prophets, when faced with the challenge, have got nothing. The true prophet Elijah, the man of God, can turn to God, and the answer is given. Well, now, we've got exactly the same thing here before us this evening. This, I say, is the real test. We say that about a friend, don't we? A friend in need is a friend indeed. He's not one of your fair-weather friends who's all over you and do anything for you as long as you've got the money and everything's going well, but the moment you get into trouble, they slink out one by one and they leave you absolutely alone. A friend in need is the friend indeed. And here is the ultimate test as to whether there is any value in our profession of the Christian faith. It is our response, our reaction to, 
our behavior in a set of circumstances when everything is against us and when we seem to be bereft of all human aid and help and when we ourselves can do nothing. What is the response? The response is what we find here. Here is true, genuine Christianity. When they heard that, when the two apostles gave them the report and told them about the verdict of the court and how now they were prohibited to speak or to teach any more in the name of this Jesus and how they can see that these authorities are out to exterminate the Christian church, when they heard that, what did they do? They lifted up their voice to God with one accord said, in other words, they prayed. They prayed. And that, I say, is the ultimate test. The ultimate test of any man's profession of faith is his prayer life. Prayer. And this is the thing I want to hold before you. What does prayer mean? Now, here again, you see, I'm asking a, a fundamental question. What a loose a lot of loose talk there is about prayer. What curious notions people have about prayer. It's extraordinary. It's almost incredible that people should hold the views of prayer that they do with an open Bible in front of them. Some people seem to think that prayer is entirely a matter of posture. That if you're, if you're on your knees, you're praying. But that if you're not on your knees, you can't pray. That seems to them to be the essence of prayer, just an attitude. Well, of course, the attitude is important. Of course it's important. But the attitude alone doesn't constitute prayer. God knows we've all of us spent much time probably on our knees and thought we were praying, but we were not. Our minds were wandering all over the world, and so were our imaginations. We were not at all conscious of God, and we were really perhaps talking only to ourselves. That's not prayer, my friend. You can be on your knees and still not pray. An attitude of devotion and of devoutness does not constitute prayer. And then many seem to think that prayer is just a question of some kind of thoughtless repetition. Our Lord rebuked the Pharisees and the scribes of his own day and generation. They thought that they should be heard for their much speaking, repetition. And you see, you've seen on the television, haven't you, perhaps, the pictures of some of these poor people with other so-called religions and their praying wheels and others counting their beads. Vain, thoughtless repetitions. And again, let's be honest, haven't we all of us many a time got on our knees and we've gabbled through the Lord's Prayer without stopping to think for a moment of the meaning of a single word that we've uttered. Haven't we all done it? That's not prayer. Saying your prayers is not praying. That's not what's meant by praying. It's a simple thing to say your prayers. And people use this language, how they give themselves away. I heard a man not so long ago uh, describing a visit he'd paid somewhere and he said, I then, uh, I, he said, I was feeling a little bit exhausted. I, I went into a cathedral and said a prayer. He dashed in, dashed out, said a prayer. Is that praying? My dear friends, let me show you what it tells. No, no. And indeed there are others nearer home a little bit to us who rather frighten me sometimes when I hear them saying quite lightly and glibly, let's have a word of prayer about it. A word of prayer about it. Almost like sending a telegram, isn't it? That's not prayer. No, no. But not only that. It isn't a matter of thoughtless repetition. Another point I must make about it is this. There's never any doubt about true prayer. There's no uncertainty about it. All this, you see, comes out here. I'm going to show it to you, but I'm putting it negatively first. Oh, we've all known again what it is to be on our knees and... We are in trouble. We don't know what we are doing. We say, is there anything in it really? Is there anybody there listening to us? What is it? And you spend your time on your knees in arguing with your own doubts and trying to persuade yourself of something. That's not prayer. It may lead to it eventually, but it's not prayer. And then some people, you read to them, we've all read of this kind of thing, and probably we've done it ourselves. Their notion of prayer is something like this. You're in desperate, in a desperate position. And you don't know what to do. And you suddenly remember God. 
and in a state of panic and of desperation, frantic, you begin to speak. You make a kind of experiment. You cry to whatsoever gods may be. Hoping against hope, you don't know what you're doing. You're just distracted, desperate, distraught. You don't know where you are or what you're doing. And you just cry out to some void in the hope that something may happen. No, that's not prayer. Well, what is prayer? Well, it's all put before us here very simply. Here are the characteristics of prayer. Look at these people. Now, don't forget the circumstances. They are absolutely essential and vital. Here are people who are threatened with extermination, threatened with death, with the end of all things. And yet, notice their calmness. Notice the quiet, assured, confident, certain manner in which they speak. They're talking to God, and they know that they're doing so. That's the thing that strikes you. When they heard that, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, thou art God which has made heaven and earth and the sea, and all that in them is. And on they go, and begin to quote the second psalm, and so on. Now, this is prayer. This is real prayer. They didn't merely get on their knees. They didn't merely repeat some set prayers. They began to talk to God. And they talked to God, I say, with confidence, calmness, quiet, and absolute assurance. What is the explanation of this? Here's the thing that is of vital concern to us. You and I are living in a strange world, a world of crisis, a world in which we never know what's going to happen next, a difficult world, a passing world, and we are all passing. Do we know what it is to pray? This is prayer, this talking to God, this speaking to him, this lifting up to him the whole situation in which you are involved. Now, this is the thing, you see, that Christianity does, and that's why I'm calling your attention to this tonight. The primary purpose of the Christian message is to bring us to a knowledge of God. You know, that is Christianity. For some extraordinary reason, this is the thing that is being forgotten. People think it's to give you some wonderful thrill and experience. All right, it may do that, it may not do that. People say, ah, but the business of Christianity is to give me assurance that my sins are forgiven. I quite agree. But you know, that's only a step. The ultimate object of the Christian faith is to bring us all to a knowledge of God. The very thing that these people have got. And if we haven't come to a knowledge of God, well, to say the very least, our Christianity is something which is very defective. Now, these men, you see, had got a living, vital knowledge of God in their extremity. They go to him with this amazing assurance. There's no panic, there's nothing frantic, there's nothing excited about them. They're as cool as men can be. And in this quiet confidence, they go to God and they speak to him. They know him. Now, that's the way in which the New Testament describes the Christian and his position. Listen to the Apostle Paul putting it to the Galatians in the uh, fourth chapter and the ninth verse. Uh, take the eighth verse before it. How be it then, he says, when you knew not God, when you didn't know God, you did service unto them which by nature are no gods. But now, after that you have known God, or rather are known of him, why do you return he says to the weak and beggarly elements where unto you desire again to be in bondage. But you see the significant statement there is he's arguing and he's able to use this argument. He says, now, there was a time when you didn't know God, but now you know God. And that, my friends, is the very essence of the Christian position. What is this knowledge which the Christian has of God? Well, clearly from this incident it is this. 
These men and women here in the early church, they knew God as the living God. They were talking to a, a person, a living being. It's the very essence of prayer. It's the thing that stands out on the very surface of this record. I say they were not crying out into the void. They were going into the presence of someone whom they knew. And oh, how vital this is. This is again a great contrast that is drawn in the Old Testament and in the New. These Galatians and others, even these, some of these people here, uh, before they were Christian, they uh, worshipped, they were religious, but they worshipped idols. They thought it was right, they thought it was true. They built temples to them. They'd made gods out of silver and gold and wood and stone and they'd erected great temples to them and they'd gone and they'd worshipped, they'd bowed down, they'd sacrificed and they were most regular in their attendance and their religion meant a great deal to them. But they were worshipping nothing. Their idols had no life. They were dead. They were only made of wood or stone or silver or gold. They had to move their gods. Their gods couldn't do anything. They had to do everything to them. Now that's idolatry. Worshipping nothing. Dead gods. Lifeless gods. Nothing at all. The projection of men's own thinking and ideas. That isn't what these people were doing. But you know there are many people who do that still. They don't know a living God. And it's not only true of people who are idolaters. You see, this is the whole trouble, isn't it, with the philosophers? Some of the philosophers say that they believe in God. But what is their God? He's just some great idea. Look at the very terms they use, how they give themselves away. They talk about the absolute, or the uncaused cause. But that's a concept, that's an idea. There's no person there, there's no life there. These people were not praying to the absolute or to the ultimate reality or the ground of being? No, no. They were praying to a person, one whom they could address. Thou, they said, a personal God. You see, it's the contrast to idolatry, whether it be the vulgar idolatry of the populace or the refined and subtle and sophisticated idolatry of the philosophers. Neither did they pray to some vague something. To whom have you been praying when you've thought you've prayed? What have you been doing? What have you been conscious of? You see, there are people who tell us that the great value of prayer is that it enables us to think beautiful thoughts. And therefore, you feel better having done it. I remember a man once preaching on prayer. I heard him on the wireless, and that's how he put it. Five minutes a day for health's sake. You think beautiful thoughts. And then others go further and say this, you see, that when you're praying for other people, what you're really doing is transferring healing thoughts to them. You are doing it all. And that is what many are doing, but it's got nothing to do with prayer. No, no. Prayer is, means speaking to the living God, an acting God. A God who looks down and who knows where we are and what our circumstances are and is able to do something about it. He's the living God. That's the one they're praying to. And then they use a term which tells us something more of their belief. They start, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord. Now that's a tremendous word that they use there. What's it mean? It means that he is a sovereign law of absolute power. It's the word out of which the word despot has come. That's the very word that they use. It was the word that was commonly used by the New Testament believers. Despot, of course, is a corruption of the idea. But even the word despot does carry with it the notion of power, doesn't it? Well, now they use the term which is suggestive of absolute power illimitable might and authority and power. Lord, the sovereign Lord of the entire universe who has absolute authority and absolute power. That's the one to whom these people were speaking. 
And that is the very essence of prayer. That in one's terrifying and terrible circumstances, one goes without hesitation, immediately and directly with confidence and assurance and boldness unto him, the sovereign Lord of the whole universe. Now then, my friends, do we know him? Can you turn to him like that in your hour of need or of trial or of trouble? This is Christianity. There was a time when these people couldn't do that, but now they can do it. And this is the thing that made the early church the thing she was, that made her turn the world upside down. This dynamic message, the only hope of the world tonight, this thing that has always become manifest in every period of revival and of reformation, here it is, a knowledge of the only true and living God, the Lord of the universe, whose power is endless and eternal. That is the difference, if you like, between religion and Christianity. Christianity is not religion. Religion is the counterfeit that has misled so many people, and I believe is keeping thousands outside the Christian church tonight. They look at the churches and chapels, they see nothing but religion, and they don't want it, and I agree with them, I don't want it. This is the thing we want. This is the thing we need. This is the thing we commend. A knowledge of the living God, the Lord God of the universe. Now, have we got that, I say? Have we got that knowledge? Are we able to rely upon it confidently this evening and at all other times, come what may? In order to help you for the remainder of our time, let me put it to you like this. On what is this knowledge based? How does one come to such a knowledge? Don't you want to know that? Is there anything else a man should desire to know comparable to this? How may I get to know him so that I can behave as these men behaved in the hour of need? We are given the answer here very fully. Let me give you the headings. This, I say, is not only a matter of experience. It is a matter of experience, but it's not only a matter of experience. That is where experiences can be treacherous. If you detach experience from the truth of the Bible, you're doing a very dangerous thing. The experience that is true and of value is an experience that results from the teaching of this book. Look at it in the case of these men. Why do they go, I say, with such calm and quiet confidence and assurance in the presence of God? How do they know him? How is God to be known? Well, the first answer is, he is to be known through nature. Through nature. Here they are, you see, in the predicament and in the crisis and the difficulty. And yet, uh, they don't think they're wasting their words nor wasting their time in saying this to God. Lord, thou art God who hast made heaven and earth and the sea and all that in them is. You know, my friends, we are living in an age when people think that it's clever to say that because they're Christian, they don't need the Old Testament. The early Christians didn't view things like that. They always started with the Old Testament. God didn't begin to live, you know, at the birth of Jesus Christ. God has been and will be. God is eternal. This is merely a turning point. You don't start with Jesus Christ. I say that at the risk of much misunderstanding. But I know so many people today who never talk about anybody except the Son. God the Son. The Lord Jesus Christ. God the Father. They never mention Him. And that's not New Testament Christianity. New Testament Christianity starts with God the Creator. Lord, thou art God who hast made heaven and earth and the sea and all that in them is. The God I believe in is the God of Genesis. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth and everything else. He's God the Creator. Now, this is the great emphasis of the Bible. And these men, they knew that this was the God to whom they were speaking. 
He is the everlasting and eternal God. They wouldn't be alive but for God. There'd be no world to be alive in were it not for God. There'd be nothing were it not for God. You see, the New Testament is full of this kind of thing. Take a man like the author of the epistle to the Hebrews. He, again, is writing to people in trouble. And he says, this is what he says to them. Through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that things which are seen were not made of things that do appear. By faith. This is our whole position, that we are not in a world that has just evolved by accident and chance out of nothing. We are in a world that has been made and created by an almighty creator who is above all and through all and in all and to whom all glory must be ascribed. Now, this was the New Testament preaching. If you go on through this book of the Acts of the Apostles, you'll find things like this. Paul arrived in a place called Lystra. And there again he was enabled to work a miracle. And they thought that he was a god and they began to worship him. And he said, Sirs, why do we these things? We also are men of like passions with you and preach unto you that you should turn from these vanities unto the living God which made heaven and earth and the sea and all things that are therein. That's it. He preached exactly the same thing to the philosophers, Stoics and Epicureans and others in the great city of Athens. And when he writes his great letter to the Romans, he makes the same point. Listen to him. He says, why am I preaching the gospel? The answer is, it is the power of God and to salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. For the wrath of God has been revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold down the truth in unrighteousness. And then he goes on to say this. Because, he says, that which may be known of God is manifest in them. Because God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. God the Creator. These men believed that the whole universe was made by God, that he made it, he controls it, he sustains it. That's the God to whom they're speaking. Do you know this God? Well, I invite you, if you don't, to look at nature and creation. Look at the order and the design and the arrangement. Is all this accident and chance? My friends, look at the evidence. Face it. All the intricacy and the delicacy and the balance that you see in the whole of created life is all this fortuitous, accidental, contingent. Of course it isn't. There's a mind behind it all. There's a great purpose and designer. Or oh, as James Jeans put it, there's a great mathematician at the back of it all. God the creator, a living God, a God who can say, let there be light and there was light. A God who brings into being things that were not, creating something out of nothing. God, the everlasting creator. That's one way. But go on, let's follow them. The second thing they tell us is this, that this God is to be known as the result of revelation. Revelation. Listen to them. Having said thou art God who has made heaven and earth and the sea and all that in them is, they go on to add, who by the mouth of thy servant David hast said. Now a better translation there is this, who by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of thy servant David hast said. Same thing. God has said it, through the mouth of David. And they go on to quote that second psalm which I read to you at the beginning. What does this mean? Well, you see, this is the way you know God. Do you want to know God? Well, I say consult nature and creation. And then having done so, and having begun to feel that there's something you don't understand, something immense, something profound, something beyond human computation and comprehension, come to this book. And here you will find extraordinary things. And nothing perhaps more extraordinary than what is called prophecy. Look at this man, King David, who lived about a thousand years B.C. Here he is, King David of Israel. He wrote that second psalm. And there he is describing some great personage, not himself. 
is describing one to whom God turns and says, Thou art my son. This day have I begotten thee. Someone who can rule kings and princes and nations with a rod of iron. And to whom you say, Kiss the son. Do it in time. Here's a great mighty governor. Who is this? Well, these men had got the insight given them by the Holy Spirit to see as David himself had seen that this is a description of the coming Messiah, the Son of God. David saw it, you see, a thousand years before it came to pass. Oh, this is prophecy, and you'll find it running right through the Old Testament. Now, my friends, come, examine the Bible. If you want to know God, read this book. Note the prophecies, note the time they were given, note the details that they gave, and then notice the fulfillment in the New Testament. That's prophecy. It means this. How did David know this? David was a very able man, I quite agree with you, but do you imagine that David could Im imagine a thousand years beforehand these precise details about the Son of God, the things recorded in the Gospels? Take your great prophets of the 8th century B.C. How did they arrive at this knowledge? How did they know about the little place called Bethlehem and that he was going to be born there and all these other things about his riding into Jerusalem and the, uh, the cult of an ass? Whence did they derive the knowledge? Here's the only answer. There is a living God. Not a wood, bit of wood or a stone or a metal. A God who is a living God, an acting God. And he's revealed truth. He's made himself known. He's given accounts of himself to men. He was the man who gave Moses the, he was the one who gave Moses the Ten Commandments. He is the one who has been giving this revelation of himself through the prophets. And here he is. He takes up men and he uses their mouths and their lips and their minds and he reveals truth to them. If I had no other reason for believing in God, this to me would be enough. Prophecy, the argument of prophecy, is unanswerable. You cannot explain it in any other way whatsoever. Here it is, staring you in the face. This God who has revealed himself and the truth to men and enabled them to utter it. And especially this matter of foretelling. So David in the second psalm, is giving proof of the living God, the acting God, this God who's above all and who's watching all. And then you see the next element is history. Oh, here's a great proof of God and the being of the living God. And how often does one in times of crisis fall back on this? Thank God for it. This is the great message, if you like, of the Old Testament, you see. It didn't all start, I say, with the birth of Jesus Christ in Bethlehem of Judah. No, no, it had been going on. Through all these centuries, this same God. How did Jesus Christ ever come? There's only one answer. When the fullness of the times was come, God, this same God who'd made the world at the beginning, sent forth his Son, made of a woman made under the law to redeem them that are under the law. And indeed, this is the great story of the Old Testament, isn't it? The Old Testament is a book of history which just tells us what God had been doing before his Son ever came into this world. And what is it? Well, it's all a proof, you see, of the fact that he's a living God, that he's an acting God, that he's a Lord God Almighty, that he's the governor of the universe, that he has all authority and power. Read the Old Testament history and you'll see it. What do you find? Well, you find something like this. He is a God who can not only make a world, he's a God who can destroy it also. He is a God who brought a nation into being. The Jews, the children of Israel. He created them out of one man whose name was Abram. And he led them and he directed them and he delivered them. Read the story. If you can explain the story of the Jews apart from the interventions of the living God, well, you've got an ability that I cannot even imagine, leave alone attain unto. There's only one explanation. They keep on giving it. They're nobody. They're nothing. How do they triumph? Oh, God acts on their behalf. For you see, as we get it in this incident here, 
God has given final proof of the fact that he is and that he's a living God and that with him nothing is impossible. How has he done it? Well, he's done it by shaking, shaking. The place where they were assembled was shaken. The place was shaken where they were assembled together. And that was just a proof of the fact that God is a living God and that these people were not talking into empty space, were not addressing gods of their own making, but were addressing the one who'd made the universe and was still controlling it and can shake buildings and men and empires and kingdoms whensoever he chooses. That's the God to whom they pray, hence their calmness and their confidence. And isn't that the whole story of your Old Testament? The God who made the world, I say, destroyed it in the flood. And then he restored it. And then in their folly they tried to build a tower up into heaven and he smashed that. He shook it to nothing. The Tower of Babel. He is the God of the Exodus, don't forget. He's made a nation, I say, out of Abram. Because of famine they have to go down into Egypt. And after a while they become slaves in Egypt and they're completely helpless. They can do nothing at all. They're in the hands of mighty Pharaoh. Egypt was then the leading power. The Pharaoh was the head. And he'd got armies and chariots and horsemen. And here are a handful of ordinary people. Just an agricultural kind of nomadic people. And they've got literally nothing. What can be done for them? Can anything? They can do nothing. But God can do everything. And hearing their cry, like the cry of these people... He answered them. He sent them a deliverer. And what he did, you see, was to shake Pharaoh and his hosts. He led them out and into the Red Sea. And there he overwhelmed them and destroyed them. He shook them to nothing and delivered his people. That's the God, you see, in whom these people believe. And I commend to you, my friend, read your Old Testament as well as the New. And you'll find him there. Look at the great scene on Mount Carmel. Elijah and the 850 false prophets against him, as I told you just now. And after they've tried and have scarified their flesh and have screeched at their gods who can do nothing, Elijah very quietly opens his mouth and says, Lord, the same kind of prayer as these people offered here, exactly, let it be known, he says, let it be known. This day that thou art God in Israel, let it be known. And he did let it be known. He sent down the fire. And it consumed the offering and the wood and the stones. And licked up the water that was in the ditch. God answering the God of Elijah. The God of Mount Carmel. The God that can destroy us in Nacarib. And all his mighty hosts in a night. Can turn the tables he shakes. As he shook this building here in Jerusalem on this occasion. History, my dear friend, will tell you about this God. Read your history. But oh, above and beyond everything else, here is the ultimate final proof. This person, Jesus of Nazareth, referred to here as his Christ or his holy child, Jesus. Do you want to have absolute proof of the being and existence of the living, true, eternal God, the sovereign Lord of the universe? Here it is. He has sent his only son into this world. He said he would. He promised it throughout the century. And then he did it exactly in detail as he said he would. And the babe of Bethlehem is the son of God and the proof of his eternal power. But look at this blessed person. Do you want to know whether God is a true and a living God? Look at Jesus of Nazareth. He said, he who hath seen me hath seen the Father. Well, what do you see in him? Well, you not only see holiness, you see authority. You see power. There he is asleep in the boat, and a storm has arisen, and the billows are rolling, and the the gale is howling. And they awaken him and say, Master, carest thou not that we perish, and with calmness, and with the majesty of God. He arose and he said to the raging of the wind, Peace, be still. And there was a great calm. That's living power. That's authority over the elements. 
that's authority over the universe. He can heal the sick. He can raise the dead, give sight to the blind. There is nothing he cannot do. Look at him. He says, you have seen me, you have seen the Father. His miracles, his power. Ah, but they take him and they crucify him and he dies in apparent weakness and they bury him in a grave. Is that the end of the story? Of course it isn't. He burst us under the bends of death. And arose triumphant o'er the grave. That last enemy has no power over him. He has all power in heaven and in earth. He conquers everything and shakes every enemy to nothing. These men had seen that. And that's why they can pray to God. He had told them, I'm going back to the Father. And if you ever want anything, you pray to my father. I'll be there to represent you and to pass on your prayer. Your father knows already all about you and all your needs, but offer him prayer in my name, and I'll be there and I'll add the incense of my own person to your feeble petitions. They know that they've seen this, the risen Christ, the power, the living Christ. So they pray with confidence. And of course, don't forget it. These are the people who passed through the day of Pentecost. He had told them when they were crestfallen and downhearted, when he was telling them about his forthcoming death, he said, don't be like this. He said, look here, I'm going to leave you, but I'm not going to leave you as orphans. I will send you another comforter, and he'll be with you and always in you, and he'll lead you and guide you into everything you need to know. And when he'd gone back to heaven, he sent the Holy Ghost upon them. And they'd seen the results and the effects of the sending of the Holy Ghost on the day of Pentecost. My friends, these are the proofs of the living God. That you don't pray to an abstraction or to ultimate reality or to the ground of all being, but to the living personal God who thinks, who acts, who sees you, who knows all about you, can answer your prayer and is ready to do so. This is the confidence. But you see, in order to be able to do it as these people did, you not only believe on the grounds of these evidences that I've been putting before you, you have a personal experience of all this. As these men had. I say they'd passed through Pentecost. They'd undergone a change. Their lives had been renewed and renovated. They were new men and women, and they knew that nothing and no one but an almighty God could do it. They were new creatures, and that God alone can create. They'd done nothing. Nobody else had done it. Everybody was against them. Who'd done it? God had done it. He said he would, through his Son and by the Spirit. They'd seen and had heard. They'd felt. They'd experienced. The power was in them. They knew they'd got life. They knew that God was their Father and that they were his children. And so, you see, it was in the light of all this that threatened with death by the Sanhedrin, the last and the supreme power. They're not terrified, they're not alarmed. They show no sense of panic or of excitement. No, no, with absolute calm and assurance. They just lift up their voice to him with one accord. Knowing that with him nothing is impossible. That these authorities and powers to him are nothing. What are they? The God who could deal with a pharaoh and a Sennacherib. The God who could drown the whole universe when it pleased him to do so. Who are they? They just quietly... Tell him all about it and beseech him for his own name and glory's sake to vindicate his own truth, to vindicate his own son, to let these people know that he is the living God, that Christ is his son, that he came into the world to save us and that they must go on preaching this blessed only hope for the world tonight that Christ has died that we might be forgiven, that we might be brought to God, that we might come to know him. So then whatever happens to us, we can turn to him and say, Oh, all-embracing mercy, thou ever-open door, what should we do without thee when heart and eyes run o'er? 
when all things seem against us to drive us to despair, we know one gate is open, one ear will hear our prayer. Do you know that, my friend? Do you know this living God? Oh, I press my question on you because I tell you again as I told you at the beginning, you are living in a world as I am which is being shaken today. Shaken. Dynasties have gone. Empires have come and have gone. We see them being shaken today. The whole world is being shaken. Perhaps soon shaken for the very last time. For we've got a prophecy about this also. This is how he has put it to us. Let me read it to you out of the epistle to the Hebrews. It's quite plain. Whose voice then shook the earth, but now hath he promised, saying, Yet once more I shake not the earth only, but also heaven. And this word, yet once more, signifieth the removing of those things that are shaken as of things that are made, that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Your country will be shaken. Your kings and queens and princes and emperors and presidents and prime ministers will all be shaken to nothing. The earth and the heavens will be shaken. And your television sets will be smashed. There will be nothing left. And your public houses will be rubble on the ground. And your dance bands will be a tangle of nothing. And all that men and women are living for and living by will be shaken to oblivion and to nothingness. But you will remain. And here is the question for you and for all of us. In that final cataclysm, when this world and all its kingdoms will be shaken and will have passed away, Will you be the possessor of these things that cannot be shaken? What are they? Oh, the knowledge of this true and living sovereign Lord of the universe through his blessed and dear Son and the power of the Holy Spirit. Christ came into the world to form a kingdom which cannot be shaken, the kingdom of God. And the vital question for all of us tonight is this. Are we in this kingdom which can never be shaken because it is the kingdom of God? How do you enter it? Quite simply, I've been telling you, confess your sins, acknowledge your arrogance, your ridiculous impudence in disputing these matters. Confess it. Ask him to receive you. And he will receive you. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. More, thou shalt enter into this kingdom of his, which cannot be shaken. It is the eternal kingdom, the everlasting kingdom, the kingdom of God and his glory. Make certain, my dear friends, that you are in it. Listen to the evidence. Repent, believe. Amen. We do hope that you've been helped by the preaching of Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. All of the sermons contained within the MLJ Trust audio library are now available for free download. You may share the sermons or broadcast them. However, because of international copyright, please be advised that we are asking first that these sermons never be offered for sale by a third party. And second, that these sermons will not be edited in any way for length or to use as audio clips. You can find our contact information on our website at mljtrust.org. That's mljtrust.org.